a very good day dear students and welcome back to year 4 the new academic year i am dr rajkumar i am going to take a class on periodontal case sheet recording so the basic case sheet recording will be dealt in your uh, clinical part during your oral medicine postings so i am going to talk about only the periodontal part of case sheet recording i am not going to go in detail about other oral diseases what you have to look about during your case sheet recording but i am going to talk about the relevance of periodontal diseases and what are all the relevant uh, histories and other things you have to take during a periodontal case sheet recording so coming on to the learning outcomes the learning outcomes are communicate with the patient and write a detailed case history respond positively to the patient's complaint listen carefully and record all the relevant histories recognize various clinical features and record it in the case sheets outline the various reasons for the diagnosis and formulate a proper diagnosis and treatment planning these are your learning outcomes for your case sheet coming on to the content so i am going to talk about patient demographic details chief complaint history of presenting illness histories, examination part, periodontal examination, your provisional diagnosis, investigation and final diagnosis. Let's go on to case sheet. What is case history? It is a planned professional conversation which enables the patient to communicate his or her symptoms and fears to the clinician and recorded in the patient's own word as to obtain an insight into the nature of the patient illness and his or her attitude to them. So the basic idea of writing a case sheet is to identify the problem of patient, what is the patient's dental problem or oral problem and finding out in the patient's own words so that you can able to elicit a proper diagnosis you can come back to a proper diagnosis so basically these are the four uh, main things you have to take care when you are taking a case history subjective objective assessment of facts and plan so subjective is the patient's symptoms so patients will give you some symptoms so you have to elicit those symptoms in patient's own words that will be give you a better idea rather than you give some hints to the patients to elicit a history whenever you are eliciting a history don't give hints to the patients get the complaint from the patient by themselves don't give hints whether you are in pain whether you are in uh, bleeding gums all those things don't give you ask why the patient visited the clinic First introduce yourself, listen to your patients rather than you give the hint and you bring the patient to the diagnosis you want to give. Don't do that. You try to elicit the real complaint of the patient so that you can give a proper diagnosis to the patient rather than you bring the patient towards your diagnosis. Right? Then objective is the science coincide with the symptoms whether after patient getting eliciting the symptoms from the patient coincide with the patient's signs what are all the signs present compare it with the symptoms whether it is coinciding with the patient's chief symptoms if the chief complaint patient say some chief complaint and there is no finding in the oral cavity then you have not elicited a proper chief complaint from the patient so that is the main idea of taking a chief complaint in case history. So when you are taking a case sheet, so you always start with demographic data. This is must. Why we want to take demographic data? Because you have to identify the patient. You have to record the patient case sheet. There may be the same name, patients with same name come on the same day but their IC numbers may be different their age may be different 
so to avoid those confusions you have to start with demographic data all the times whenever a patient is seated on your clinic you first ask the patient name cross check with the patient card what they have whether it is the same then you start taking up the case sheet so start with the patient name patient age patient sex patient address patient occupation and the patient case sheet number patient ic number all these things are important while taking a case sheet why we want to take all these things because name will help you in identifying the patient and you can able to recall the patient case sheet by making a proper record of the patient identification details for communicating with the patient most of the time when you talk to the patient by saying the patient's name the patient will uh, psychologically uh, feel more secure compared to, to doesn't know the patient name and you are talking to someone without uh, converse uh, conversing without even telling their name so the patient will not have a confident on you so always try to communicate with the patient with the patient's name age some periodontal disease and gingival diseases are prevalent in certain age so age is important when you are taking a periodontal case sheet for example in uh, infants and uh, children you see herpetic diseases and gingival stomatitis eruption gingivitis are more frequently seen compared to older age peoples for example at the age of 11 to 17 years if they, it is a female patient you can able to see puberty gingivitis if it is a male patient or a female patient during the age of 17 to 27 you can able to see the uh, third molar erupting which may result in pericoronitis so you need to know the age of the patient so sex of the patient again the gender will help you to identify certain periodontal diseases and gingival diseases certain periodontal diseases are uh, gender oriented for example for female patients you can see puberty gingivitis pregnancy gingivitis menopausal gingivitis all these will be seen on female patients than male patients right address to collect the address to have a proper communication with a patient so you need to have a patient details so that in future you need to communicate with the patient then you can able to identify the patient the one more thing is endemic diseases some diseases is pertain to some localized areas so with that uh, getting the patient address you can able to identify that those the endemic diseases so that is the role of your patient data or biographic data then move on to the history part history part it starts with chief complaint then elaboration of the chief complaint which is history of presenting illness so once you take the chief complaint then you have to elaborate on the chief complaint when it comes to perio the chief complaint may be bleeding gums pain swelling mobility of teeth sensitivity due to exposed to root surface food lodgement or aesthetics these are the most frequent chief complaints you see in patients with periodontal disease so once you get these chief complaints any one of these chief complaints then you have to elaborate on the chief complaints it starts from when did first appeared how it progressed what aggravates it what relieves it any associated symptoms are there for example if there is a bleeding gum you have to ask the patient when the patient first seen the bleeding gums how frequently the bleeding gums happening so whether it is induced by uh, anything or it is happening by spontaneously so how long if the bleeding happens how long the bleeding prolongs when it stops and how frequently it happens 
so which aggravates this bleeding whether the patient taken any medication or any relieving factors to relieve that like that your question should go so that you can able to set a proper history of presenting illness so you have to go by order you have to find out when happened how it happens what aggravates it what relieves it any associated symptoms always follow the chronology of time period so from the beginning when it started till today what are all the things happens for the chief complaint those things you have to elicit from the patient then past medical history why medical history i am talking here some medical diseases may play a role in either inducing periodontal disease or affecting the periodontal tissue by the modifying the response of the local factors to the periodontium or it may require modification in your periodontal treatment so the medical history is going to be helping in diagnosing a oral manifestation of a systemic disease or determining a systemic condition that may be affecting the periodontal tissue response to local factors or diagnosing a disease that requires special precautions or modification in the treatment procedures so these things we have to identify so you have to ask for medical history for example if the patient is having diabetes the patient will definitely have periodontal disease because diabetes and periodontal disease are go in hand to hand so both seems the same mechanism of disease progression so if diabetes is there there are more chances for that patient to have periodontitis so you have to really elicit the medical history some patients may be in drug for example patients with phenytoin for epilepsy those patients will have changes in the gingiva like gingival enlargement will be there because of the drug the patient is taking so those things you have to elicit from the medical history if there is no medical history then just write it as no relevant history don't write patient is not a diabetic patient is not hypertensive patient is not renal failure patient is doesn't have any cardiac problem don't write a long story which is negative for our diagnosis if there is no findings well and good you directly write it as no relevant history okay so next is your dental history once you finish your uh, medical history you have to ask about the dental history why dental history is important you have to identify the frequency of patient using a toothbrush the frequency of patient using the interdental cleansing aids how frequently the patient goes for a dental treatment what happens in the previous dental treatments these are all the things which is important for us to know how the patient going to react to our treatment for example if a patient is anxiety and feared or and even full treatment happened in the previous visit the patient will be already terrified so the patient will not be so much cooperative for a dental treatment on the visit when the patient came so these things are important so when you are taking a past dental history you have to take a detailed history detailed history from the beginning so if the patient have undergone a restoration 15 years back you have to write that out you have to write it from the first dental visit when the patient goes from here if it is in from the childhood you have to write from the childhood so from childhood what are all the dental visits the patient went in what are all the treatment patient undergone these are all importance next is the personal history personal history you have to identify the patient's habits if patients are having habits it is if it is uh, there are different types of habits there are some habits which are deleterious to the oral cavity for example grinding or clenching habits mouth breathing habits tobacco smoking nail biting these harmful habits can affect the gingiva 
so you have to identify what are all the patient's habits if the patient doesn't have any habits you can write it as no relevant history if the patient have the habits then you have to elicit a detailed history about the habit for example if the patient is a smoker then you have to identify what type of uh, thing the patient is smoking how long the patient is smoking how frequently the patient smokes how many per day the patient smokes whether it is cigarette cigar whatever it is so how many times the patient is smokes all these things you have to elicit this will help you in identifying the severity of the habit and the severity of the dental problems you can expect based on the habits other than the habits you have to ask the patient's brushing history so brushing history is always important because you are doing a periwinkle you have to know the proper brushing method what is the frequency of brushing patient using what by what means the patient is brushing whether it is your patient is using a toothpaste or a tooth powder a toothbrush or a fingers or a neem stick there are different ways the patients can utilize to brush the teeth so you have to your duty is to identify what the patient is using if you identify a toothbrush then you have to ask which type of toothbrush whether it is hard soft or medium the frequency of to brushing how frequently the patient brushes which method the patient using to brush why are, how what is the frequency of changing the toothbrush all these are important for example the frequency of toothbrush will determine how clean the oral cavity will be the method the patient is using will tell you how the oral cavity or the gingiva will be for example if a patient is using a hard toothbrush and a aggressive vert horizontal uh, brushing motion you can expect some gingival recession in such patients or cervical abrasions in such patients so this history will help you in guiding you to come to a proper diagnosis so if the patient uses any interdental cleansing aid again you have to ask what type of interdental cleansing it how frequently the patient uses it what method the patient use to use the interdental aids all these are importance for a case sheet once you finish the history part then you are going for the examination part so the examination basically divided into general examination extra oral examination and intra oral examination so the general examination you must have been aware when you are year 3 you must have been dealt with general examination and extra oral examination by your oral medicine department and by general medicine and general surgery department so i am not going to go in detail about your general examination and extra oral examination i'll jump on to intra oral examination when it comes to intra oral examination it's further divided into soft tissue examination hard tissue examination and gingival and periodontal examination i have put gingival and periodontal as separately because i am going to talk only about periodontal case sheet so soft tissue hard tissue examination i am not going to go in detail those parts they will uh, your oral medicine department will talk to you related to the soft and hard tissues when you are going for your oral medicine postings so i am not going to talk much about your soft tissue and hard tissue the soft tissue part what are all the things you are going to see is your palate lip tongue soft palate alveolar mucosa buccal mucosa floor of the mouth posterior facets signs of xerostomy all these things you have to evaluate under soft tissue and when it comes to hard tissue examination you have to examine the total number of tooth present the decay missing filling counts the calculus stains food debris the patient occlusion patient whether the patient is having any wasting diseases any rotated tooth any malpositioned tooth spacing crowding supranumerary tooth impacted or submerged tooth tooth mobility overhanging restoration proximal fracture restoration all these things you have to examine you have to examine all these things in your heart tissue examination then we go on to the gingival and periodontal examination 
so gingival and periodontal examination basically uh, the gingival examination there are six cry, uh, findings you are going to examine when you are doing for gingival examination and there are six findings for your periodontal examination for example gingival examination you are going to identify the color contour surface structure consistency bleeding and probing and exudate and cession shape so these are the things you are going to check in gingival examination so when you are examining a patient so do this systematically so once you ask the patient to open the mouth you check the color of the gingiva so the color of the gingiva varies with different individuals and different ratios so you cannot have a uh, stipulated color so okay every patient should have coral pink no definitely no not every patient will come with a coral pink color some patients will have pigmentation some patient will not have pigmentation some patients gingiva will be more paler some patients will be more dark so you have to know how to identify or differentiate a healthy gingiva from a diseased gingiva starts from color the color itself will tell you whether the gingiva is healthy or it is diseased for example if there is a disease there will be reddening of the gingiva there is erythematous gingiva you can see the color will be more reddish compared to a normal healthy gingiva contour contour is another thing you have to identify the contour again it is not going to be a standard contour for all the patients it varies with various factors there are a lot of factors going to affect the contour of the gingiva for example position of the tooth in the oral cavity alignment of the tooth in the oral cavity spacing crowding all these things will affect the contour of the gingiva so when it comes to scalloping don't think that the scalloping is the scalloped line you see between two teeth no scalloping is a finding where you have a knife faced marginal gingiva with pointed interdental papilla these two points joins together to form the scalloping so you should understand that a scalloping is not a two dimensional picture what you see in the gingiva it should be a three dimensional picture if there is a rolling out of gingiva rolled out gingival margin then the scalloping is lost it is not present a normal scalloping should be with a knife edged marginal gingiva the marginal gingiva should always flush to the tooth surface in a single line if it is not happened then the gingiva is not healthy that is why we are going to see the color contour the surface texture stippling whether the stippling is present or absent stippling is nothing but a orange peel appearance when you dry the gingiva surface with a cotton or a gauze you will be able to see a minute small small dots like an orange peel appearance that is stippling again this is not a static finding where you will see in all the healthy patients no it may vary from different patients some patients it will be very clearly seen some patients the stippling cannot be visualized very clearly that doesn't mean that the patient is having disease next is consistency of gingiva a healthy gingiva should be firm and resilient any other consistency other than firm and resiliency is a disease then bleeding on probing bleeding on probing is an important clinical finding for gingival and periodontal examination bleeding on probing will tell you whether disease is present or not so this is a positive indicator for disease and mere absence of bleeding will not tell you there is no disease there may be this is present even without bleeding but whenever there is a bleeding present there is definitely disease is present so that is the difference in bleeding on probing 
so mere absence of bleeding on probing doesn't eradicate that the disease is not present but whenever there is a bleeding the disease is present so that's why we are taking bleeding on probing and we are telling this as the first clinical sign of gingival disease whenever you see a bleeding that is the first clinical sign of gingival disease there may be there are some sub gingival uh, findings uh, subclinical findings like your increased uh, gingival cervical fluid those are the first sign of gingival disease the first clinical sign is bleeding on probing and the first uh, subclinical finding for gingivitis is your increased gingival cervical fluid so these are the things i have uh, talking about so you basically have to see the color contour consistency surface texture bleeding on probing and size and shape these six things we are going to see for gingival findings so when we are assessing the bleeding so you have to insert the probe on the bottom of the pocket elicit bleeding if the gingiva is inflamed and the pocket epithelium is atrophic or ulcerated there will be bleeding it is the earliest sign then color change so before the color change there will be bleeding that is why i told it is the first clinical sign of inflammation depending on the severity of the inflammation the bleeding can may vary from a pinpoint bleeding to a profuse bleeding if the inflammation is very mild it will result in pinpoint bleeding if the inflammation is very high then there will be a profuse bleeding so to test bleeding on probing you have to carefully put your probe on to the bottom of the pocket and gently move along the pocket wall and you have to wait for 30 to 60 seconds to evaluate bleeding if it is a mild inflammation you can able to see a pinpoint bleeding only after 30 seconds so the minimum time period you have to wait is 30 seconds to evaluate the bleeding on probing next is the periodontal examination the periodontal examination again there are six findings which are probing pocket depth gingival recession furcation involvement with a fatter gingiva pathological migrations or frenal attachments so we'll go one by one so periodontal pocket there are two types of pockets one is biological pocket and one is clinical pocket biological pocket is the distance from the gingival margin to the base of the pocket or the coronal end of the junctional epithelium whereas the clinical pocket is the distance of penetration of probe into the pocket so obviously a clinical pocket will be shorter than your biological pocket biological pocket will be deeper compared to your clinical pocket so the probing technique is you have to evaluate the pocket on all six sides of a tooth mesiobuccal mid buccal distal buccal mesiolingual mid lingual distal lingual all six sides you have to probe so you have to walk the probe you cannot just move the probe inside the uh, pocket so you have to literally take out the probe once you probe it on one side then you have to take it out and move it to the next side to evaluate the probing depth what will happen if you just run the probe when you run the probe what you will do is you will move the probe laterally from a deeper side to a shallow side when you move that the uh, junctional epithelium will cannot able to withstand the lateral forces the junctional epithelium have a very good capability of withstand occlusive forces a vertical force you give the junctional epithelium will resist if you give a lateral force it will not resist so if you try to run the probe in the uh, sulcus you are inducing disease you are going to induce the or tear the junctional epithelium so you have to walk the probe you have to literally take out the probe and you have to insert it to the next site next is clinical attachment level clinical attachment level the 
we have seen the pocket the pocket is the distance between the base of the pocket to the gingival margin whereas clinical attachment level is measured from the cj to the base of the pocket right so a periodontal pocket is measured from the gingival margin to the base of the pocket whereas clinical attachment level is measured from the cement enamel junction to the base of the pocket so that is the difference between pocket and cal so how what way it is going to differ for example if the gingival margin is at the level of cj then your pocket will be equal to cal if the gingiva is covering one or two millimeters coronal to the pocket normally the gingival margin will be coronal to the cj so in such cases when you evaluate the pocket the pocket depth will be more compared to the clinical attachment level in case of gingival recession the gingival margin will be apical to the cj in such cases your pocket depth will be less than your clinical attachment level so these are all the variations you can see between pocket and clinical attachment level you need to evaluate both to come to a proper diagnosis for example there may be a pocket of 5 mm but the cal will be zero then your diagnosis cannot go into periodontitis your diagnosis should still stay as gingivitis so that's where the comparison of pocket and cal going to help you in the next periodontal finding is gingival recession or position of the gingiva so this refers to the level of gingival margin where it is attaches to the tooth surface so when it comes to recession we will call it as apparent recession and actual recession apparent recession is the part of the recession which is visible clinically that is the distance from the cement enamel junction to the gingival margin crust of the gingival margin which is called as apparent recession whereas actual recession is from the cement enamel junction to the base of the pocket that is the actual recession so based on the gingival recession uh, miller's classified gingival recession into grade 1 2 3 and 4 these things will talk to you when we are start taking classes on gingival recession and its management so basically you have to know what is apparent recession what is actual recession what is recession and how it differs from periodontal pocket next is width of attached gingiva width of attached gingiva is going to help you in coming to a treatment plan so the width will determine whether the patient what type of treatment you are going to give to the patient so how you are going to calculate the width of attached gingiva so you have to calculate the total width of the gingiva from the gingival margin to the cement enamel uh, uh, to the muco gingival junction from gingival margin to the muco gingival junction the total width of the gingiva then you have to measure the pocket depth so you have to minus the total width of gingiva to the pocket depth you will get the width of attached gingiva right so when it comes to adequacy of gingiva when you need to know about the adequacy of gingiva you have different test like tension test roll test schiller's iodine test these things will tell you the width of attached gingiva one is measurement method the other is schiller's iodine test this two will tell you the width of attached gingiva whereas the tension test and roll test will tell you the adequacy of attached gingiva so this is your periodontal and gingival findings next we are going to indices so when it comes to periodontal periodontics department we are going to implement four indices you have to take four indices for your periodontal case sheet the first one is oral hygiene index simplified second is modified sulcus bleeding index third is russell's periodontal index and fourth is basic periodontal examination index so there are four index you have to go back and read these four indices 
so these four indices is mandatory to be known for taking a periodontitis case sheets so overall age in index simplified modified sulcus bleeding index russell's periodontal index and basic periodontal examination so i have given a link for your bpe you can go into the link and download the bpe document so that you can read about basic periodontal examination it is available in uh, bs uh, the period.org uk it is a uh, american uh, london site uh, where uh, the bpe was published so you can go and download so i have shown you a picture of different codes given for bpe once you start reading the bpe you will be able to understand what is this code 0 1 2 3 and 4 and what is its role in diagnosing and treatment planning next is your periodontal charting again i have given the link for your periodontal charting online so you have to literally test it then only you will understand what is periodontal charting for example the probing depth gingival margin or gingival recession forcation involvement bleeding on probing all these things i have spoken to you but to understand how to measure it how to uh, record it you have to literally go into the site put some values then you will come to understand how it works so for a periodontitis case sheet it is mandatory for you to take a periodontal charting if you are planning to do treatment for periodontitis case sheet it is mandatory to have a periodontal charting for a patient so that will tell you how severe the disease is once you finish your history part your general examination your gingival and periodontal examination and your indices you will come to a provisional diagnosis so with all the findings what findings and your uh, examinations what you have done you can able to come to a provisional diagnosis so the establishing a provisional diagnosis of a specific periodontal disease is process in which the examiner utilizes all the information uh, information assembled about the patient to determine which of the recognized periodontal signs and symptoms best present so your provisional diagnosis for periodontal disease should always include the duration of disease whether it is a acute disease or a chronic disease and depends on the site whether it is localized disease or a generalized disease so the inflammation of the gingiva with bleeding on probing may indicate gingivitis a presence of mobility recession forcation or a periodontal pocket may indicate periodontitis so based on your findings you are going to come to a diagnosis so the diagnosis should be acute localized gingivitis or generalized chronic generalized periodontitis so your findings should be whether it is generalized or localized whether it is acute or chronic and whether it is gingivitis or periodontitis right so based on these three things you are going to give a provisional diagnosis so always write all the three components of your diagnosis localized aggressive periodontitis localized chronic periodontitis generalized chronic gingivitis like that you have to write so once you come to your provisional diagnosis if you required some investigations like radiographs blood investigations or any advanced investigations you have to do those investigations to come to a final diagnosis so the final diagnosis in periodontal disease mostly it will be generalized chronic gingivitis localized chronic gingivitis in relation to what tooth or generalized chronic periodontitis or localized chronic periodontitis in relation to what tooth other than that you have a localized aggressive periodontitis or generalized aggressive periodontitis or acute exacerbation of a chronic periodontal abscess and chronic periodontal abscess these are all the 
possible diagnosis you can give for periodontal disease so all the possible diagnosis i have listed out these are the only possible diagnosis you can give in periodontitis and gingivitis so once you do the diagnosis you can go ahead with your prognosis and treatment planning which we will tell to you in the following classes so this is your case sheet template and i have given the link for you to identify where is the case sheet in our e portal so the case sheet is already present in e portal you can download the case sheet and whenever you are taking a case sheet you can utilize this case sheet to fill up your periodontitis case sheet so it is mandatory to take two gingivitis and two periodontitis case sheets as a part of your continuous assessment so it is mandatory to take two gingivitis and two periodontitis so go through the case sheets and start taking your case sheets when you are posted in your oral medicine department or your period departments okay thank you